Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. And today, I am filling the second of the requests I sold on Patreon. And today's patron gave me a couple options, but I knew instantly which one I wanted to cover. See, I said before that I didn't listen to much or any pop music when I was a kid, but there was one exception. I don't remember where I got it, but I had this CD of 80s movie themes that I, I played all the time because I had Ghostbusters on it. It's also where I first heard The Power of Love, Maniac, and a bunch of others, so I still have super fond memories of everything on that CD. Even Take a Look at Me Now, which is not a song you really need to listen to more than once. And right in the middle of that CD, there was this. I can see a new horizon from the new this is St. Elmo's Fire, parentheses, Man in Motion, the theme to the Brat Pack movie the same name. Minus the Man in Motion part, it's just St. Elmo's Fire. I don't know how well people remember the song, it's, it's not like I heard the song on the radio ever, except once randomly last week while I was writing this episode, which has to be a sign. And I know people don't remember the singer. Matter of fact, John Parr seemed to dwell in this weird subgenre of rock of sweaty, hairy guys who weren't really flashy enough for MTV and made a living solely off of big pump-up soundtrack hits. You know, guys like Stan Bush, you got the touch. Paul Engeman, Joe Esposito, yeah, tie yourself to a well-liked movie and your songs can have a surprisingly long shelf life. And that definitely worked for John Parr. This was a number one single in 1985, in between Huey Lewis's The Power of Love and Dire Straits' Money for Nothing. 85 was apparently a good year for rock songs by spectacularly normal dudes. So that's what we got this week, a kick-ass inspirational anthem with a weird title by a guy no one's heard of. I live for this kind of music. Let's check this guy out. First off, is John Parr a one-hit wonder? Honestly, kind of, but kind of not. I'm, I'm stretching the definition a little here. Because anyone who was around back then might remember this little number. So this is John Parr. Can you tell he's from New Jersey? Because he's not, he's British. You can be an artist, you know, you can be the shiny new car with... But I'm pretty sure that from the second he was born, he was handed an official New Jersey birth certificate and driver's license. I mean, Christ, look at him. Before we get to this, let me go backwards for a second. John Parr was just a kid from Nottinghamshire, England, who wanted to pursue a career in music. He got injured while watching a performance by The Who in 1980, and while he was being tended to backstage, he met their manager, John Wolfe. And since the Who were basically on their last legs at that point, Wolf decided to start managing Parr instead, because, I don't know, waiting tables wouldn't have been far enough a drop in prestige. The first major gig Wolf got for Parr was as a songwriter writing album tracks for Meatloaf. Yes, everyone's favorite era of Meatloaf, 80s Meatloaf. When Meatloaf performs live, everyone screams for him to perform Blind Before I Stop and Midnight at the Lost and Found. Yep. Anyway, John Parr released his first album in 1984, which brings us back to this, Naughty Naughty. Yes, this big lumpin' oaf wants you to know that he doesn't want no nice girls because he likes sex. He's a sex-having guy, as you can tell by his muscle car, open-chested leather jacket, and American flag guitar. Again, Parr is from England, not America. And again, John Parr is the most American man I've ever seen in my life. Look, this is pretty lame. Like, you can call a girl naughty and that be hot, but, but calling a guy that? Or worse, a guy calling himself that? You might as well say, I'm a bad widow boy. But regardless, this was kind of a hit. It almost cracked the top 20 on the pop charts, but it was number one on the mainstream rock charts. I'm, I'm not clear what the mainstream rock format entailed, but I gather it was basically mullet rock, one of the three major subgenres of 80s rock music. Well, now having established himself as being a very naughty boy, he got another assignment. Seems some movie producers believe they had the summer movie of the year on their hands and gave the composer like a week and a half to come up with a theme to it. 
The dude recruited John Parr to help him come up with the song, and just a short time afterwards, the world was given this. The Brat Pack movie St. Elmo's Fire came out in the summer of 1985. It did decently well, but the theme song did amazingly well. Not everyone saw the movie, but everyone heard the song, which rocketed to number one that year. Actually, come to think of it, I haven't seen the movie either, although it seems to be one of those sort of fondly remembered quintessentially 80s movies. I should, I should check it out. I mean, it, it seems cool, you know, classic coming-of-age tale. It's got young Rob Lowe and young Demi Moore and half the cast of The Breakfast Club, and it was directed by Joel Schum... Uh... Um... Let us never speak of that movie again. Anyway, let's talk about the single good thing about that movie, the theme song, which is so good, it kind of makes you forget that you're watching a beyond shitty piece of up his ass, badly written, badly acted, puke stain of a gut. Schumacher series movies are so much worse than his comic book stuff. I don't want to hear another complaint about bat nipples ever again. Anyway, the song. who want the strange title explained, St. Elmo's Fire is this weird weather thing where ships would suddenly have blue lightning coming off of their ship, and it looks really cool. In the movie, it's the name of the bar the characters go to, but it's also a metaphor for not a goddamn thing, because it's way too stoop. Fortunately, that's really its only connection to the movie. It's only in there because the producers demand Parr drop the movie title in there somewhere. Parr hadn't even seen the movie. If you want to know the real inspiration, look at the second part of the title. Yeah, the wheels he's talking about is actually a wheelchair. See, there was this Canadian Paralympian, Rick Hansen, and he wheeled his way across the world, Forrest Gump style. He called it his Man in Motion Tour. Good, good decade for inspirationally disabled Canadians, the 80s were. That really does explain why there's such a pump-up, inspirational tone for a theme to a movie about confused, whiny yuppies coming of age while also being crazed, violent stalkers? What the living hell, shoot? Anyway, yeah, wheelchair athlete. Makes the song make way more sense. Okay, you don't know me, John Parr. Don't presume we have anything in common. Oh god, he described me perfectly. It's like he saw right into my soul. When I was a kid, this song seemed to promise a whole grand new world opening up to me. Of course, I'm an adult now, so now this sounds super cheesy to me, but in all the best ways. You know that cheesy little horn bit right here? You know you can quit into this one. That's the charm of the song in one riff. John Parr hits all the same notes as Journey. He's just too sincere to be ashamed by any of the things he sings. And I think I could tell this was about an athlete even as a kid. For one, it's all about moving forward, coming stronger. I feel stronger just listening to it. The boy in me, but you won't beat the man. The man in me is tough. The man inside me is hard as a rock. Not like the little broken boy I had inside me. I feel like I could be wording this better. And as further evidence of Parr's inner Americanness, note how he used the eagle as a metaphor. Hogan could use this song as his entrance music, that's how American this is. And yet, ironically, for a song about forward motion, this is where John Parr's career hits a sudden brick wall. John Parr's first album was still new and circulating when St. Elmo's Fire hit it big, so he was basically obliged to keep releasing singles from it. Which meant that rather than releasing more music that sounded like St. Elmo's Fire, he was putting more stuff like Naughty Naughty out there, which is not what I would have advised him to do. Right before St. Elmo's Fire came out, his single at the time was called Magical, and I found it mostly forgettable. Although this particular image is something I will never forget. 
but instead I would like to focus on the one he released right after St. Elmo's Fire, which is called, no joke, Love Grammar. <laughs> this is awful. Back in the day, MTV had this fake parody boy band who sang a song and it was something like Love Calculus. And it made considerably more sense than this. No one in history has ever thought that affairs of the heart were in any way comparable to proper sentence structure. Unless... Hey baby. Let's conjugate. No, that's worse. Love Grammar? More like Lou Grammar. And in case you don't know, Lou Graham is the lead singer of Foreigner, and that's pretty clearly what John Parr is trying to be. You will not convince me that John Parr didn't see Lou Graham's name and then turned it into Love Grammar. Okay, like I said, he was still burning off singles from the first album, but let's see what he wrote now that he had St. Elmo's Fire under his belt. Blame it on the moonlight Blame it on the radio I just want to hold it tight Well, um... He's not trying to be naughty-naughty anymore. That's a good thing. You know, be more heartfelt, less sleazy. Get it on that more Heartland, Springsteen-y vibe. Yeah. <sighs> Look, there's no way around it. This sounds awful. Like, what's with the production here? Like, the vocals, for one, just, just sound terrible. There's just something off about them. This, like, this is like a, a scratch tape. And, and, dear God, who picked that synth tone? Ugh. If John Parr's career ended based on this, I would point the blame directly at the producer. No Mutt Lang, that guy. Yeah, who, who even was it? Oh, there you go. Well, yeah. No more lonely nights! If you know anything else about John Parr, it's probably because you remember his theme from The Running Man. Man in Motion, Running Man, there's a, there's a theme here. But I can't help but feel like this song would have made more sense as a theme for a Rocky movie or something, or, you know, a Karate Kid sequel, not a movie where Arnold murders assassins in stupid outfits on a game show. Here is Sub-Zero! Now, Plane Zero! And if you are a very dedicated Meatloaf fan, you may remember his 1986 duet with Parr, Rock and Roll Mercenaries. I'm talking about rock and roll mercenaries. Money is power, and power is fame. Yeah, we are rock and roll mercenaries. We are cold, passionless, and we're only in it for the money. Wait, are they calling themselves rock and roll sellouts? He didn't record any more music for six years, and I only ever released a couple more albums in the 90s to widespread apathy. Pretty much the only notable thing he recorded during that time period was this. But I want to cut ahead to 2011, because this is what he's been doing recently. Yes, he wrote his biggest hit to be about the world's most beloved second string quarterback, Tim Tebow. He also wrote a whole album dedicated to our troops in Afghanistan fighting to protect our freedoms. C keep in mind, I'm not talking about Trace Adkins or anything, I'm, I'm still talking about John Parr. So, yeah, I think at this point he has systematically eradicated every speck of Brit from his DNA. He gets annoyed if you try and call soccer football because real football has quarterbacks and cheerleaders. And he tells other Englishmen that if it wasn't for America, they'd all be speaking German right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, not really. Yeah, I, I got basically what I expected out of this one. John Parr was not a man with the talent or charisma to last more than a couple songs, but my opinion of St. Elmo's Fire, the song remains unchanged, even despite the lousy movie or the badness of any of the guy's other stuff. But yeah, this was a fun request. I'm, I'm glad to have put this together, you know, even if I did kind of bend the rules on what counts as a one-hit wonder for this one. You know, it was a request. They paid. So, let's see what the next requester wants.